folks, welcome back to the TRE Podcast. Matt Celestio here, coming at you hot with another great episode. We're coming off a little bit of a break, so thank you for your patience, but I promise you we've been working very hard in the back end for creating some really great content. We got Cody Dake again here in the studio. What is this, your fourth time on the podcast, third time on the podcast, man? I think it's the third time. Yeah. Third time? Dude, every time you come on, it's been just a... Great snippet of wisdom, really inspirational, and uh, I'm excited to have you back. So thanks for being on, man. Thank you for uh, ha- having me on for a third time. Of course. Now, uh, as everyone knows, whenever I dive into an episode, I always ask my guests what the intention is for this episode ahead. So do you have an intention today for our listeners? I do. My intention for today's episode, Matt, is to inspire the listener to give themselves a the permission to explore new outcomes, new possible outcomes for their lives. Because I feel like in this day and age, there's a lot going on, a lot of chaos. And what I've come to realize is that change is possible right now. All the circumstances and conditions to create change in your life is all available now. Everything is perfect right now. We just need to allow ourselves to explore those possible realities. I like that you say explore because I feel like a lot of us don't do that. We don't give ourselves the opportunities. So like you said, giving ourselves the permission to just see what you could actually attain, you'd be surprised what some people can actually achieve in their lives. So I love that, man. Now let's set the stage here because as per our earlier conversation, we spoke about this concept called the mindless era. So to get right into the episode, I want you to set the stage for our listeners today. What is the mindless era? And how do we know if we're falling right into it now? Mm. I see the mindless era as the period in where, like, where society is right now. We're in a state of constant consumption, in a state of chaos, where nobody is truly living a life by their intention. And it's a big problem that I see right now. I think it's one of the core problems that I personally see in society is we're in a state of continuous consumption and we're not leaving time to reconnect with the most important thing, which is ourselves. And I think that is the biggest pandemic that's happening right now is people have lost touch with themselves, with their dreams, with the highest versions of themselves. And I think that that is something that I'm really driven right now in my career to help people change um, going from not being connected with themselves to being able to truly connect with their purpose, with their why, with themselves. Because I think when people are truly connected with themselves, the world becomes a better place. Mm, Yeah, definitely. The one thing that stuck out for me there when you said uh, we're in that consumption phase, I think that's so applicable to so many facets of life. Like I know we talk about social media where everybody's always consuming content, just consume, consume, consume. But I'm just coming back from a trip in New York and just being a little bit aware in the city. Consumption is everywhere. And a great example was just the way that we consume so much packaged food. Like the amount of times I would see people just consume left, right, and center. Like that guy's having a pop. That guy's having a snack from whatever convenience store. That guy's having some prepped food. Like they just consume, 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 and it's a way of life for them. Mm -hmm. They don't stop to actually say, you know, is this going to nourish my body? Can I make a healthy food that I need at the moment? Is my body lacking certain nutrients? So even looking at how consumption is just bred in every facet of life, and it's not like intentful action. It's just kind of the stuff you do on a daily basis, and you just do so much of it so fast, almost kind of tuned out, you know what I mean? Exactly. I mean, it, and to a certain degree, it's like you, you can't even blame people because that is the base animalistic state, right? Like if, if you look at, at, at the human as, a, as purely an animal, which to a certain degree it is, the default state is to consume because what are the primary needs? We need to be fed. We need to be hydrated. We need sleep, right? So we are in a state of just continuous more, more, more because the the body and the mind is at its fundamental core is programmed for scarcity. So it's like we don't know when the next um, period of abundance will come. So we need to just consume, consume right now. And I feel like people fall into that default state and they don't allow themselves to evolve 
that makes sense. Yes, and it's it's jogging my mind right now. The other thing with consumption, I find, is whenever we consume stuff, we get a dopamine hit. Mm. Social media, Netflix, you even want to go down to like alcohol, porn, like all that stuff. Even just food. Food's fucking good, mm-hmm. right? So it's always this constant pursuit of dopamine. And we feel like because dopamine is such a powerful drug, it's such a powerful endorphin, the body is kind of uh, subject towards what the mind wants. Mm. And even if it's not in the best interest. So understanding like the constant pursuit of dopamine is also contributing to a little bit of that mindless automated behavior. Wondering why you're kind of stuck because dopamine's addicting, man. It really is. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. And I was actually just having this conversation with a client two days ago. Yeah. And, you know, how I was explaining to him was that like, imagine there's dopamine that they're chasing. It's a, it's a finite resource inside of your brain. You have a certain amount every single day that your body has in store. So if you start the morning with scrolling, with pornography, or with um, high fatty foods or w- w- whatnot, you're going to drain that system very quickly. So then you're not going to have the drive to pursue anything meaningful throughout the entire day. And so if you do this day after day after day, you're going to be drained of the key um, Motivator. Ke- chemical that, mm. that propels you to achieve things. Wow, man. Yeah, that it, it is uh, interesting that you say that too. So that probably even attributes to the fact that we kind of feel like a zombie, sluggish, on autopilot, just going with the whims of the day. Is that kind of the vibe? That's exactly what it is because you are drained of your chemical that allows you to pursue something because there's no discipline behind it. So that's why it can be really difficult to propel yourself into action because your, your dopamine systems are completely shot. Dude, okay, so then in that case, this, this conversation is kind of going down that route. Is this uh, mindless era pretty much self-imposed, or are there other factors at play we need to be aware of here? Well, it's definitely both. The, the, the part where it's not self-imposed is that we've all done this collectively, right, of just, you know, hyper-capitalism, hyper-consumerism for the sake of profits. But I bring it always back to it's self-imposed. Not to say that the other is not true. It's just that the moment we externalize a reason for our suffering, we are no longer in power. So I'm really big on self-accountability. So if you want to create change in your life, it's not going to benefit you to say, oh, it's capitalism uh, that is the cause for me not having dopamine. It's X, Y, and Z. No. If you want to create change in your life, you need self-accountability. So I always say that it's self-imposed because fundamentally, we all have the capacity to say no. Mm. We, have the, we have the capacity to say no to the food, no to the pornography, no to the scrolling. But again, it's, that takes self-accountability and discipline. Absolutely, man. Now, uh, I love that we had a real line on the direction for this episode, shifting our focus back into intentional living. So kind of what you just touched on there with a little bit of self-accountability, but can you dive into what you mean by intentional living and shifting back from this mindless era? What does that look like for someone? Living an intentional life is exactly what it sounds. It is living a life by your own intentions, by your own desires. And I see it as living a life by your design, meaning that you are consciously choosing to live a certain way despite of your past conditioning and your past programming, Mm. right? Now that requires conscious effort. That requires you to wake up every single day and make a conscious choice to act a different way despite of how you may currently feel. I like that. And even to define it a little bit uh, in a different lens, I always like to say the exact opposite so people understand like the way I'm currently living is uh, really, really um, far off of what we're talking about with intentional living. And I would say the, auto, the opposite of that is like autopilot, living on autopilot. And I believe there's two ways you live in autopilot is number one is you're kind of told and shuttled into a way of life. And number two is just being in a reactive state constantly. So a great example is we should want, like we follow that social script. We should date that person because X, Y, and Z says like, we're just told to do that. And because it's, we're in that docile energy, like you said, it's not intent, intentional, purposeful living. We find ourselves going down this path, wondering how the heck we ended up getting there. So for one, that's autopilot being told what to do. Number two is the reactive autopilot. 
So you're just trying to play catch up all the time. You're not in this place of control to make conscious choices, to make intentional choices. So we're just playing catch up with a to-do list. We're playing catch up with work. We're playing catch up with errands, with text, with everything. And it always feels like your head's never above water. It's mm-hmm. always below. You're always trying to keep up. So there's two ways to look at intentional living from the exact opposite, which I think helps define it for listeners. Yeah. And I feel like that reactive state really ties back into we are reactive when we are operating by our program because something happens in your external world and your program is designed to react to whatever circumstance based on your beliefs, your habits, how you choose to see the world, your attitude, etc. And so that's why mindfulness is so important, living an intentional life because mindfulness, the way that I see it is it separates us from the external outcome. It gives us like a buffer period where something happens to us and we can pause and we can reflect and ask ourselves, how do I want to react to this situation? And then instead of reacting, you're responding. Ooh, that's a nice distinction. You're responding. I actually had uh, Charday on on an episode not too long ago and she kind of talked about the same philosophy versus conscious inputs versus unconscious inputs or subconscious inputs kind of the same thing rather than just getting triggered and reacting and (laughs) going to the whims of what your primal limbic brain is doing you catch it in the act and say how would the person i want to become or the person i am destined to be react or respond so i think even just having that little nugget in the back of your mind as you go throughout your day to say like yo let me stop myself here before i say something stupid before i engage in a negative behavior etc etc because then you can change the trajectory of where you want to go. It's more intentional living that way. Exactly. And like the thing about autopilot is that autopilot isn't inherently bad. The problem, like autopilot is actually a very good thing and we should learn how to leverage autopilot. But the problem is where autopilot is bringing you to. Mm. So it's like if you use the analogy of a plane, well, let's say you want to go to X destination, but your autopilot is bringing you to Y destination. Well, that's a problem because you don't want to go to Y destination. You want to go to X destination. So actually, part of living an intentional life and living a life by design is by learning how the mind works and using the autopilot to course correct you to the destination that you want to go. Because if you were to fly a plane off autopilot, it requires a lot more effort because you always need to be in control of mm. the aircraft. Whereas if you can learn how the operating system works, you can consciously choose to set the autopilot on a different direction and help you. Now, that does require conscious effort in the beginning. But as you start creating change in your life, start building momentum, positive momentum, creating change becomes a lot easier. It's not to say that it, it is easy, but it, comes, it becomes more effortless. And it's almost like, improving your life and creating change in your life in a positive way becomes your automatic program. Yeah. And it's like, it, 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 it happens automatically. It's interesting. You say that that's a good perspective, like using autopilot to your advantage. I think one of the other key distinctions here is if you are going to leverage autopilots through positive habits is identifying and clarifying that destination. Like you said, it's that life by design. So don't just implement habits mindlessly or a trajectory mindlessly. Figure out where you got to go first because having that crystal clear clarity allows you to understand what actions to take, what type of characteristics you should embody, kind of like our earlier previous conversation, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's another thing with this reactive living that a lot of us do either on autopilot or just, you know, trying to maintain this like overstimulation of control is you don't get to clarify what that destination is because you're in the day to day. Mm. It's kind of synonymous with working in your business versus on your business, Right? You want the higher level bird's eye view. You want to know where you're going, how to direct your employees there and be the leader to get them to that destination. But until you can remove yourself from that reactive state and define that piece or that place you want to end up at, I think that's the first thing you got to do before you start implementing X, Y, and Z for autopilot. That is the exact first step that you need to do is you need to identify where you want to go because how do you expect to get to a destination if you don't even know where it is? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Like that, that, that is the fundamental question. But I, I, I want to touch back on like for people who might be wondering like, OK, well, how do I use this autopilot to my advantage? Mm-hmm. Well, one very simple way we were having this conversation before the podcast was what is the brain? Well, the brain is a problem solving machine. It, it tries to solve problems. 
The problem is, is that most people are asking themselves disempowering questions. Why is this not working out for me? Why is it taking so long to achieve success? Why is money so hard to get? Mm -hmm. Well, your logical mind operates in a logical way. So if you ask yourself, why is it so hard to make money? Why does nobody want to buy from me? Your mind will be like, okay, well, let's go find reasons why people don't want to give us money. But if you ask yourself empowering questions, you ask yourself, why am I so good at what I do? Why is it so effortless for me to um, close prospects on, on a call? And you start asking yourself empowering questions. Well, your mind is just going to find the, the responses to those questions. So it's about using your biology the way that it was designed instead of rewriting it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, there's one thing I'm going to add to that too, um, is the concept that we're addicted to negative emotions and that negative way of being. I know you're familiar with this concept, but I'm going to lay it down for the listeners because it's fascinating too. The same way that we like to perpetuate negative thought patterns because it feels comfortable is the same way that we will seek out behaviors that elicit those negative emotions to further reinforce that. I'll give an example in my life. Like when I was starting out sometimes, especially on social media, I would always go look at views to see if like I was finally or I finally made it or whatever you want to call it. But I always knew like my engagement was a little low and I was constantly going back to look at those real views to further reinforce like, see, I told you I wasn't going to get high views. I wasn't going to get good engagement, blah, blah, blah. But now sometimes when I go post, do I find myself slipping back into it? Yes, because I'm addicted to that negative cycle of, you know what? I need to blow up. I need to do this. I need to do that. But I find the days where I just like let it do its thing. I was like, you know, that was a good piece of content. Let me go out with the guys. 5K, 6K views, 7K views. It's like, well. I wasn't constantly checking and perpetuating that reality of low views, low engagement. I wasn't addicted to that behavior for a second because I pulled myself back. So I think that was a really cool experience for me. And do you know what you did in that moment? Is it resistance? You got moment? out of your own way. Mm, elaborate. Getting out of your own way, I think, is one of the quickest ways to creating change in your life. Because we have, like you're saying, we have these fears, we have these perceptions, these beliefs but what, what, but what we believe to be true, we think that we're not worthy of achieving 10K views, whatever it is. And so for me, I like to, like I define a successful day if I was able to get out of my own way. And what I mean by that is separate myself from the lower versions of myself, from my past conditioning, my, my past beliefs. And that requires me to become aware of it in the first place. Mm. So when I do a really good meditation or a really good yoga floor the moment I get back to my present self, like the moment I get present, I've overcome the self because I'm not tied to a past condition and I'm not trying to anticipate a future outcome. I'm just here and now with zero expectations. I'm just creating the content for the sake of creating content and there's no attachment to it and there's no resistance like you were saying. Mm. So the moment you can drop resistance, everything can flow. I have a background in mechanics, so the way that I visualize it is electricity and water work the exact same way. If you have a pipe with, let's say, 100 gallons per minute flowing through it, and you put a restrictor in there, there's now going to be less flow at the opposite side of it mm -hmm. because there's resistance. So if you want to increase the flow, you can try to pump as much water down the inlet as, as you want, but there's a restriction in there that will prevent a certain amount of water from flowing at the end. Mm -hmm. So the moment that you remove that resistance, everything can start flowing through. So it's not about necessarily adding more to your life. It's about removing as much as you possibly can to allow things to flow through. It's, it's kind of like the analogy that a lot of people use on like our consciousness, our vibration, our growth is effortless because it rises kind of like a buoy in the ocean, it wants to rise, but we need to cut off all of those anchors, all of those weights that are holding us down. And mm -hmm. what's holding us from growing in our lives, from achieving the success that we want, the dream that you want, whatever it is, we are being held back by our fears, by our beliefs, by our current habits, our paradigms. And so it's not about what's the next best strategy. It's what can I remove about my old program that will allow me to naturally evolve. That's a beautiful analogy, man. Really, really well articulated. And I'm going to just tack on to it too. I had a friend come back from um, Nepal. Same time you were there, actually. She was doing a yoga instructing uh, certification. 
And she learned one of the other essential elements that she never knew about because we know air, fire, water. What's the other one? Uh, air, fire, water, earth or whatever right. it's called. She goes, there's a fifth one, which is called space. And I go, elaborate on that. What, is, what do you mean by space? And she goes, the magic happens in the space. The space between you and that other thing. The space between you and that other person. Like you allow, allow things to come in, but it only happens when you detach from whatever outcome, from whatever... Um, thing you're trying to perpetuate and actually manifest. The space is when the universe is like, okay, well, I will lend our helping hand now. And you'll see that when you have no, no resistance and that detachment, that's when you create the space. That's how you create the space. And uh, take your foot a little bit off the gas. You know what I'm saying? That's exactly, well, I mean, it, it's, it's very similar to what we were talking about before the podcast on how I really love going back into nature because it helps me step back and gain pr perspective. Because if we're in a state of constant action, constant go, 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 hustle, grind, how is life supposed to weave in those serendipities, those opportunities, if we're trying to control every minute of our day? Like, I'm a big proponent of, yes, if you want to live a life by design, you need to have some degree of control over your time because we all share the exact same finite resource, which is time. You can't buy more of it. We all have 24 hours. So you need to optimize it, sure. But if you have every second of every day planned from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed and there's zero room for um, new circumstances to, to pop in, for unknown situations to, to pop in, how are you going to have those magical moments, those serendipities, those, those whimsical experiences where you're like, I could have never anticipated this happening, but it's in that space, like you were saying, that when we create space, we can allow magic to flow in, mm -hmm. in an esoteric way. Mm -hmm. And that comes from detaching from that autopilot and kind of reactive routine that we're all kind of going through in this mindless era. Yeah, because it's like, what's the rush? You know what I mean? Like, I want to achieve success. I have, I have financial goals. I have materialistic goals. But like at the end of it, it's like, what's the rush? Mm -hmm. Like if it happens tomorrow or five years from now, so what? I think the biggest part in living an, in, 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 an intentional life is being able to just fully enjoy the moment for what it is right now. Because if you're not going to enjoy the moment right now, chances are you're not going to enjoy it when you have a million dollars in the bank. Facts. It's just how it is because money is just a tool, right? Like money is just the, the stored time and energy of other people. It's just a tool. Yo. Right? Whoa. Where'd you pick that up? That's a good snippet, man. I, I, I heard it from somebody. I don't remember who it is, but it rung so deep inside of me like money is just a tool it's just the, the stored time and energy of other people but yet we're so attached to it whatever you think oh when i have this elusive resource that everybody on this planet wants more of then i'll be happy then i'll have the freedom then i'll be able to like enjoy life but money is just a magnifying glass it'll just amplify you so if if you are living a crappy existence and you hate your life you're miserable Yes, money, money alleviates a lot of problems. It's the third most important thing after your health and your relationships. Mm -hmm. So it's the third most important, but it won't make you happy. It won't make you more fulfilled with life. It'll certainly improve aspects. Um, there, there's that law. What is it called? The hedonistic law? Oh, hedonic adaptation. Yeah, where, yeah. you know, when you achieve something, you'll have a spike in happiness or a spike in dopamine, whatever. But at a certain time, that feeling will go away. Just like when you buy yourself a brand new phone, you're taking care of it. You're, you know, make sure you don't drop it. But two weeks after that, you throw it around like it doesn't even matter. Yeah. So that'll happen when you make the money. That'll happen when you've quote unquote made it. So I think it, it's important to separate ourselves from the materialistic things and allow ourselves just to fully be satisfied and be happy with where we are right now. Because if you separate yourself, everything is perfect right now. Every, every ingredient you need to start creating change in your life, it's all here. But we need to separate ourselves. And that doesn't mean don't go achieve the money. That doesn't mean go achieve the nine figure business, whatever it is, the five cars, whatever. But just know that those will not fulfill you long term. That mm -hmm. has to come from within. Yeah. You know, I'm going to circle back to what you said too, when you say kind of like waiting 
to get to that end point, waiting to live your life. When you get to that end point, when you'll be happy, you'll be fulfilled. You can do all these things now that you have all this success, whatever that looks like for you, money, cars, um, whatever it is. I used to be the exact same way. I used to, I deliberately used to like not go out with my friends, not go on trips or just not do things like even go longboarding out like on a Saturday morning. I was like, I can't do any of that stuff until I have X amount of dollars. I have X amount of success. I would even turn down women. I'd be like, you know what? No, I don't have the time. I'm not going to do that. I don't have the space for that because I need to get to that goal that I always thought I wanted. But I have recently shifted my lifestyle. I would probably say over the last maybe seven, eight months, maybe I would even push a year where I said, you know what? Screw the goalpost. I'm going to do all that stuff now. I've gone on more trips. I've gone on more dates. I've met more people. I've had more fun. I've definitely partied a lot more than um, when I did before. And Cody, let me tell you, not only is like, do I enjoy my life 10x more, the abundance and opportunity that comes in now because I've created space and that detachment from that goal, I started just living my life how I wanted now. So naturally, I can find myself climbing up that ladder towards where I needed to be in a much more sustainable way, in a much healthier way, and I'm having more fun along the way doing it. It's just crazy to see that when you actually make that decision to say, let me get to that end destination and enjoy this freaking process, as cliche as that freaking mm-hmm. sounds, it does make a world of a difference. I've experienced both ways, and I'm telling you, the way where you're enjoying it on the way, 10x better. And the reason you need to enjoy the process is because from this very moment, Until the day you die, the process never ends. The process is always unfolding. So if you're not enjoying the process now, why do you think you're going to enjoy the process five years from now? Mm. Right? I had a very similar thing where right now I'm, I'm living in Toronto. I'd rather be in the mountains in British Columbia. But I asked myself, I'm like, okay, well, how can I incorporate nature into my life right now? Mm. So like I was telling you, I have a habit of I dedicate at least an hour of my day to spend time in nature, no technology, whatever. I'll even climb a tree almost every single day just because it helps me reconnect. So it really goes back to the idea that, yes, maybe you're not going to have everything that you want in its final form right now, but there's a version of it that you can fulfill right now. So for me, I'm in Toronto right now, so I can't be in the mountains, but I can go find a park where I can just go hang out and then just immerse myself in that nature right now Mm -hmm. you're not waiting you're doing it now exactly so okay let's let's transition this conversation a little bit because the first part of this episode was talking about that current situation of our mindless era living on autopilot being tuned out now i want to transition into you know tuning back in making the process of change as practical as humanly possible those were your words as well in our earlier conversation We want to help people manifest their dream life. So we understood where the problem lies, how we perpetuate that problem ourselves. So let's get into how we can manifest that dream life. So again, set the stage here. Like what is manifestation for someone who is very unclear about what it means? Because this could be a new age juju topic, but it does pack a punch. And I know a lot of entrepreneurs and people who are in that analytical business world, they all talk about this manifestation. So let's set the stage. Manifestation is not something that we're doing or that we're not doing manifestation is an unfolding process that is happening everywhere every single time the way that i see manifestation is it's energy moving into particle it's thought turning into thing it's an unfolding it's it's a becoming Mm. so the most practical thing that i that i can use as an analogy is think of the the light bulb right thomas edison invented the first light bulb that was just an idea before. People b- before him would have never have thought of this idea of this thing where you can press a switch and a room illuminates. That was just an idea that existed in the, in the ether, right? But he got this idea and he turned that thought into thing by using himself as a vehicle to materialize the concept of a light bulb to now it's a staple in all of the world. Mm. That's manifestation. It's not this thing where you sit there and you think about it and magically sh- shows up on your lap. It is turning th- thought into thing, idea into form, and also from thing back into energy. So when you know the human body dies, it decomposes and it moves. That's manifestation. It's the continuous transmutation of energy. Oh, continuous, continuous transmutation of energy. I like that, man. 
But even on that uh, conversation with uh, Edison, did you say Edison? I can't remember. Yeah, yeah Edison. I, I got to learn on my history, man. Um, but when he thought about that light bulb, he probably asked those the questions like you spoke about in the earlier part of the conversation is, how do I make the room illuminate on a switch? He's thinking about, he's asking different questions and he's focusing his energy somewhere else to manifest a different outcome. Mm. Not, he didn't buy into the collective where everybody goes, that can't happen. You can't do that. We got to light a fire. He was asking, he wasn't asking, oh man, well, I, I don't think I can ever be able to do that. He's asking, okay, well, what are the steps to put that energy into a light bulb and turn it on? So I think that was another key indicator I want people to understand is when you're going to manifest stuff, ask how you're going to manifest it, right? Because it gives you some more clarity on that too. Exactly. And I feel like the role we all play to, to manifest the things we want in our lives is we just need to be the best vessel that we possibly can for these ideas to move into form. So whether it's an idea that you want to invent, whether it's a product or service that you want to incorporate and share with the marketplace, mm. or it's your dream life, like whatever this idea or vision that you have, the only thing you need to do is be the best possible vessel for it to move into form. So Rick Rubin, he had this idea that ideas have souls of their own and that when an idea comes to you, it's ready to be brought into the world. And he, sh and he was saying, you know, the thing of think back at a time where you had an idea, but you didn't take action on it. And then a few months later, that exact same thing came to fruition, but it was by somebody else. Mm. It was because that idea was ready to be brought into the world, but you weren't the right vessel to move it, to, to allow it to move through you because ideas need to be materialized and it, they use us as a vehicle, as a vessel to materialize it. That's fantastic. And yeah, I, I can count on uh, two hands how many times that's happened where I go, oh damn, I thought about that a couple of years ago. I should have acted. Um, but one personal story I actually have on that is uh, with the Revive Academy, like when we launched that, uh, before we did that, like I, I shifted my entire business model before the academy was even a thing. I got the idea for the academy in a meditation. It just came to me one day. I go, that would be a fantastic idea. And then it was amazingly fast how many other creators in the wellness space were like, I'm on board. There was no resistance to it. And it just flowed so easily. You know, we were at the launch party, right? Everything came so together so fast. The recordings went well. The programs launched well. The launch party went well. And it was because I guess I was in that right vibrational uh, alignment to receive that information. And then I understood how to put it into practice. I didn't just leave it. I go, let me materialize and manifest that. So I think what you're saying about being the vessel for mm -hmm. an idea or the vessel for something that to materialize, make sure you're always in that accepting state to actually receive that because it, it, Revive has com completely changed because of that. And my ability to do that. Exactly. And, you know, for people asking, okay, well, how do I become the best vessel or vehicle for these ideas, for my dream to bring itself in? And what I say, it's adopting the philosophy and the practices of self-mastery, meaning how can I become the best possible version of myself? How can I develop the traits of discipline, of confidence? How can I have a strong mind, a strong body, have strong relationships around me? How can I work on my nutrition and my rest so I can have the most amount of energy? So when an idea comes, you're driven, you're disciplined, you have a good network to support you, you have a lot of energy because you're physically healthy. These are all the traits of a healthy vehicle where when that idea comes, it can effortlessly move through you. Because if you're not treating your nu nutrition properly, you're not working out, you're overweight, you're lethargic, you're kind of like stuck in this like half droning phase, how are you supposed to materialize an idea, let alone your dream life? That's true. So that's why, you know, Jim Rohn, one of my favorite personal development uh, mentors, he said, if you, if you want to make a living, work hard on your job. But if you want to make a fortune, work hard on yourself. I love that, man. I love that. But yeah, it's a true testament. Like you can't take action on your business, on your relationships, on your, even on your health, if you're not healthy or you're not at least willing to put in a little bit of uh, uncomfortability to start making improvements in each of those areas of your life. I like that, man. But now from our earlier conversation, I wanted to ask you about tuning back into our purpose. 
I think that's a huge one, especially when we're going to talk about manifesting our dream life. Purpose is an integral part of this. So what do you mean? What do you mean by this? Like tuning back into our purpose? I know you even have a good story on this yourself too. Mm. Yeah, this is a very big problem in the entrepreneurial business space of being connected to our purpose. Mm. And what I mean by that is we live in a society where we all have a very gen- generic idea of what success is. It's the nice cars, the nice house, the beautiful partner, um, this idea of like we've made it. Now, that's all fine and all. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. But in, in my experience coaching, I have found that the people who say that they want that, they actually don't want that. They want it because they want to prove to other people that they are capable or that they are worthy. Mm-hmm. So it usually stems from a place of unworthiness of wanting to prove themselves to other people because in their childhood they weren't good enough or they got bullied and they weren't enough so they want to prove to people in their later years that they were enough again nothing inherently wrong with that but the thing is is that it's if it's not our true purpose our true why in life it's there's always going to be some degree of resistance because it's not truly connected with that deeper sense of meaning so Yes, you, you will still achieve that, that goal because pain is a fantastic motivator. It's probably one of the best motivators we have as humans. But what will happen is we'll get to that end state. We'll have the nice cars. We'll have all of this. And we'll realize, shit, this didn't make me happy. Mm. This didn't fulfill me. And then that's why you'll see people in, in their later years who have made it, they'll have these these awakenings and they'll realize that oh crap what really mattered was what i was truly passionate about what was truly driving me and that's not to say that you need to monetize what you're passionate about but there needs to be an avenue in your life where you can connect with that deeper sense of meaning that's so true man i have even experienced that firsthand too sign x amount of clients make up x amount of dollars for whatever in the entrepreneurial space that i'm in i wake up i go yeah, I still I still feel like garbage today. I still feel like garbage. Meanwhile, I thought I'm like, okay, once I make make X amount of dollars, I'm chilling, I'm good. So I've even experienced that firsthand. So what you're saying is very factual. And it kind of goes with what to Jim Carrey said, like I wish everybody can experience that so they understand it's actually not the answer. Because everything is always the grass is always greener. When I actually do make that, I will feel happier. Whatever these people are saying who have the money, they don't understand. Mm-hmm. But I think like if you actually did experience it, you'd be saying the same thing as everyone else. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a really big thing about this ri- the race, the grind, the burnout culture, that personal development community that we all got going on right now, always pushing us to strive more, always pushing us to achieve more. So I want to know for you, that does this whole industry or this whole collective and community push us away from our purpose or does it actually pull us towards our purpose? I feel like initially it pulls us, it pushes us away from our purpose initially okay. because we will chase the next hot thing we'll chase what everybody wants the the nice lambo or the or the red ferrari right but then in the later years it will pull us back to our vision because we'll get so far away where we get to rock bottom and then we'll realize shit that's not what it was and then we start the path of rediscovery Mm -hmm. so it's kind of a twofold approach but you know i think fundamentally the sooner we can reconnect with our purpose, the more fulfilling and the more aligned our life will be. Because again, like it goes back on what we were saying earlier that money is just a tool. And most people say, oh, I, I, I want more money. Like I, I ask a lot of prospective clients of mine, what's your goal for the next six months? And like, oh, I want to get to like 20K months. Cool, but like, what are you going to do with that 20K months? Like, why do you want that much um, tool? Or like, why do you want that much leverage? And like, oh, uh, I haven't really thought that far. I'm like, cool. So like, you just want 20 grand because you think 20 grand is like the outcome. It's like, no, it's just, it's a vehicle that will fuel a certain lifestyle. And if you, if you think of like the kind of life that most people would genuinely be fulfilled in living, it doesn't require that much money. And I'm not saying go get money because in my experience, Matt, people that say that money's not important are all broke. Mm -hmm. Money's right? very important. Money's very important, right? But that money needs to be used to 
achieve the life that you want to live. Because if you don't have that purpose, if you don't have that vision, no amount of money in the world is going to make you happy because it's just a tool. Like I can't emphasize enough that it's just a tool, but for some reason in society, we are so obsessed with this currency because we attach, we attach our desires with the money. Mm, yeah. You know what? I'm going to, I'm going to, I agree with you and I'm going to relate it back to health. Um, just to give some sort of uh, dynamic here. When we're talking about the pursuit of money or they want that 20K a month for whatever reason, but they don't actually understand why they want the 20K, how their lifestyle is going to look, what they're going to be doing with their time. It's kind of the same thing that I went through with uh, like body image in that sense. A lot of guys, I know for a fact, we see ripped guys on Instagram. They're shredded, they're big, they're jacked. It's only natural to follow suit to that. And I... I remember at the beginning of my gym journey, whatever you want to call it, a journey, I was head down, lifting heavy weights, consuming crazy amounts of calories, eating whatever, because I knew in my head, I go, I just want to look big. I just want to look jacked. And that was kind of where it stopped. But again, it never, no matter how big I got, no matter how fit I looked, no matter how many compliments I get, I never felt like I was looking in the mirror going, yeah, I like that. I look good today. Barely ever. It wasn't until I understood what I actually genuinely wanted was I want to feel healthy. I want to feel energized. I want to feel good. Now, when I go to the gym, it's a much different energy. It's a much different excitement. Before, I would hate going to the gym. 5 a.m., I go, man, I'm so tired, but I got to hit it. I got to look good. Now, it's like, you know what? I'm going to sleep in a little bit today. I'm going to go do a lighter afternoon session. I'm going to just move my body because I know it's going to make me feel good. I'm not going to consume all these crazy amount of shitty calories because it's, again, not going to make me feel good. Am I going to lose a bit of muscle, a little bit of size? Absolutely. But I'm tuning back into my purpose, which is health, feeling good, feeling energized. It's a much different um, experience once you clarify that. Yeah. And what I'm about to say, a lot of people might disagree with at at the surface, but I believe this to be true, is if you look at some of the most successful people, they're like, your feelings don't matter. You're going to hate most of the process. It's going to be hard, gruesome, whatever. And they're wildly successful. So people are subscribed to that. And there's nothing wrong with that. Because again, pain is a fantastic motivator. And you can will yourself to overcome anything despite of how you feel. Hmm. Now also, but the thing is, is that how we feel is so important. Like we can only control our thoughts, how we feel and the actions that we take. Now that's not to say that we should let feelings stop us from taking actions, especially if they're in alignment with our goals. But what I'm saying is that like, if you're not enjoying it, like if you hate going to the gym every (laughs) single day, then do like figure out a form of exercise that you will enjoy. Because if you hate every step of the journey and you're just determined to get to that outcome, then what's the purpose in even living? Like, yes, there will be times where you don't want to do it and you're going to show up anyways. But for the most amount of the time, like you have to at least enjoy what you're doing because if you... If you're not enjoying life, then to me, that sounds like a very miserable existence. And I don't want personally to live a life that is miserable. And I hate most of it. Yeah, absolutely. And you bring a different energy every time you show up to it. Like yeah. You just you don't care about the business. You don't care about the gym. You don't care about the relationships. Like you're just doing it to do it. It's a much different vibe. Exactly. Like a very quick analogy. Like I don't really like doing weights in, in the gym. I find it boring. Mm. But what I do is I do calisthenics. I do rock climbing. I do mountain biking. I do outdoor adventure sports because that's what I love. And I get really fit doing it Yeah. because I chose to do what I love. Some people will love dancing. Some people will love swimming. So it's like, just find the, this is something that I heard once by Abraham Hicks and I guide my entire life by it. This is how powerful it is. She said, if you're stuck right now and you don't know what action to start taking, that's in alignment with your high self, follow the excitement. Follow the excitement. So if you if if you're if you're laying in bed right now and you're you're down bad, you're not doing well mentally, physically, whatever it is, ask yourself, what is something that I can do right now that will give me even just a little bit of excitement? Is that is, is it is that, is that like a nice bath? Is that going out in nature? Like make myself a nice warm tea? Like what what will generate me a little bit of excitement? And once you start following that excitement, that is the path towards alignment. Mm, you'll slowly find it as you continue to engage in those habits. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I, I want to um, reemphasize, 
you're not always going to enjoy. There are going to be parts where it's not always fun, but for the most part, man, find that excitement because everything will start to unfold better and faster than you can ever imagine if you're acting in accordance with your higher self. Yes. I think the other thing to add on to there is when you start engaging with that stuff, it's very effortless. It, it's not hard to stay consistent. It's not hard to get up. It's it's not hard to recover from it and you feel energized after it. Those are all good indicators like you are on a path of alignment. Exactly. Correct. Right. So let's talk into the actual like mechanics behind this manifestations and change because I know with a lot of your clients, you want to make this change and manifestation as practical as humanly possible. So like, what is your number one way to help us jumpstart this? I know you said follow the excitement, but what's something else like the number one that we can do here? Well, the process of change is quite simple. And the way that I break it down is first you need to identify where you are right now and the destination that you want to get to. So this means building a vision for yourself. What kind of life or objective do you want to achieve? Because again, like I was saying, how do you expect to get somewhere if you don't even know where it is? So you need to at least start identifying that process. And it is ever unfolding, but at least get a, a pretty clear image of, of where you want to go okay. right now. That's the very first step. The second step is what I would call character development, or this is uh, like pattern detection. And it's identifying what is the, what kind of characteristics do I need to incorporate in my life to start being a match to that vision? Because again, it's, it's cause and effect, right? It's that the thoughts, the feelings, and the actions that we take are going to get us those results. It's cause and effect. So once we know where we want to go, we can start identifying how do I need to be thinking on a daily basis? What kind of actions do I need to be taking? What, how do I need to be seeing the world for me to be a match to this? And once you start identifying the person we need to become to be a match towards that vision, then we can systematize and break it down and look at Okay, what are the highest level habits or highest level beliefs that will move the needle the furthest in my life right now? So let's say you're like, okay, I lack discipline. I lack confidence, whatever. Okay, well, so let's work on the discipline right now because if I'm not disciplined, that's a very fundamental character trait that I need to, to develop to get to my goal. Mm. So I'm going to start working on that habit. And you start going through, you go down this list from top to bottom, from most important to least important. And you just work on these habits, work on these beliefs systematically until you become that guy that is a match to that vision. Like that's why if, if you take a, a multimillionaire and you take all of his money away, all of his contacts away, it's only a matter of time until he gets all of that back. And that's because he is a person who has the standards to achieve that amount of money, that amount of success. Yeah. Yeah. It even goes back into his identity. Probably like he understands that, you know, money isn't and money doesn't bring him his confidence. Like the fact that he can make that money is the same thing. Same thing with body image. Like if you, if you just believe you're a fit person, a healthy person, you don't need all like the clothes to make you look a certain way. You don't need the angles in the gym to make you look a certain way. You just believe that. So again, it helps you take actions uh, more aligned. So I'm assuming this is also what you meant by, uh, systematizing again that process of change it sounds like it's very like one two three four this is the pattern to go ahead and manifest that is that what you mean by that exactly yeah and and i mean the the initial phases of building a vision identifying your purpose for achieving this vision which is also very important this is more esoterical it's more abstract i figure like okay if there were no limitations like what kind of life would make me excited to wake up in the mornings once you get that, then you can slowly start becoming more practical. Like, okay, I know where I want to go. I now know the person I need to become. I know the character traits, the beliefs, and the habits that I need to incorporate in my life, the kind of standards I need to at least be a match to this. And then now I have it in a list, and now I can systematize it. I can go from habit one, two, three, four, and I work on them one at a time until I slowly become that person. Because the one thing, the one mistake people do is New Year's comes along and they try to change their entire life in one big go. That doesn't happen because you don't have momentum in changing. Your old program has so much momentum that it's so hard to change it. So you need to 
incrementally become 1% better every day, show up 1% more. And that, that change will start creating momentum where eventually you can create so much change in 24 hours because you've built momentum. But initially you need to start from the highest level leverage habit and work one by one to incrementally change this person and, and it'll compound over time. I like that. So what is, let's say somebody who lacks a system right now in their life and the way that they're going about their goals, how do they know if they lack a system? You lack a system if there's no consistency in your life. You'll have positive months, negative months, highs and lows, and it kind of wavers. You don't feel like you're making progress. Like you feel like you're stagnating and there's no real growth. Like either things are going really like really well one day and then really bad. And there's just not a lot of consistent momentum in a singular direction. Mm -hmm. Because also like if you have consistent direction going downwards in a negative way you probably have a system but it's a horrible system of you're always waking up you're waking up and you're scrolling you're um watching pornography for a thing or do like doing whatever that that is a system but it's a negative system Mm. and so the process that i outlined of identifying a vision identifying your reason for achieving that vision identifying the person you you need to become to achieve that vision and then in a systematic way, slowly becoming that person by incorporating the the habits, that is the process of change. That is the process that has taken me from working a nine to five as a mechanic that was completely burning me out to being able to travel the world while doing the things that I love and, ha- and growing a company that fulfills me to the core. That is a process that I went to create that change. And that I think it doesn't matter what kind of life you want to achieve, if you follow that system, you will achieve what you want to achieve. So Cody, today, as we come at the end of this episode right here, I want you to leave listeners with one piece of advice you'd give to old Cody, who was struggling with that change, burnt out, directionless, unfulfilled in his pursuit towards a greater life. One piece of advice, what would you give him right now? If I had to give one piece of advice to my old self, it would be to develop the trait of discipline. And more specifically, get really comfortable pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone because change is uncomfortable and it does get easier over time. But if you want to achieve any form of growth or change in your life, get comfortable with being uncomfortable because also in that process, not only does it make you more mentally and physically resilient as a person, but it generates more clarity and direction in that process. And it, I would say that that was a prerequisite to me even knowing what I, what I wanted. Before the vision, before knowing who I needed, needed to become, just getting really uncomfortable with being uncomfortable gave me the opportunity to explore different outcomes, different scenarios from my life. And it allowed me to dream a little bit because I wasn't stuck in the known I was allowing myself to step into the unknown. And I think that if I would have told myself, surrender yourself to the unknown, get really comfortable with that, your life will change faster than you can ever imagine. And that's exactly what happened to me. Beautiful, brother. I love that, man. We're going to wrap up here. So plug yourself. Uh, where can listeners find you, connect with you online? Um, because we're going to send them somewhere after the show. Where are we sending them? Yeah, I'm mostly on Instagram. I'm also on TikTok, uh, YouTube, all of that. But I'm most dominantly on instagram at nomadic underscore cody and if you have any questions from this conversation or something that i didn't explain quite right or you had any questions literally just send me a message on instagram and i will reply to you um so yeah with that being said matt i really really appreciate our conversation today always do brother thanks for coming on third time's the charm on the tre but uh, until next time man thanks for tuning in and listeners we'll see you very soon on the tre